Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to Artist Decoded. This is your host, Yoshino, and you're listening to another exciting episode of Artist Decoded. If this is your first time tuning into the podcast, we are a podcast where artists interview other artists or where I interview other artists about their process and about their current state in life. This episode, I get the opportunity to talk to Diego Perez, also known as Young Pueblo, if you follow him on Instagram. And he is a writer known for his book entitled Inward, which you can find on Amazon or your local bookstore. Let me read a couple of passages from this book. I kept running away from my darkness until I understood that in it I would find my freedom. Don't run away from heavy emotions. Honor the anger. Give pain the space it needs to breathe. This is how we let go. And, you know, I really like Young Playboy because he talks about complicated feelings and complicated scenarios, but in a very simplistic way. Even the format of his book is either a couple of sentences or a paragraph on each page, and it's easily digestible, but it has so much weight to the things that it's presenting within the book and the ideologies and the philosophies in the book, which I really admire about his writing style. And we were able to talk about his creative process along with how he writes. And we talked about this revelation of selflessness and unconditional love, which is something that I've talked to other people on the podcast about, but I really like his thoughts to be able to dissect the origin of when he started thinking about that more deeply. Just his overall writing process in general is really fascinating to me, and it was good to be able to dissect that writing process and to talk to him about it as well. Also, I'd like to give a shout out to Jen Sodini for putting us in touch Before we begin the episode, please go to our iTunes page and leave us a review. It helps for viewers just like yourself to hear about this podcast, and the more the merrier, so put out a good word about the podcast. All right, so here it is, my conversation with Diego Perez, aka Young Pueblo. Hope you enjoy it. Seriously, thanks so much for taking the time to be on Ars Decoded, and I really appreciate it. No, I'm, I'm honestly, thank you so much for asking, and I'm really happy to be speaking to you today. This is going to be fun. Yeah, definitely. I think, I, you know, I don't think I met you at Whitma back in, I think it was 2017 yeah. or 18. Yeah. But, oh, you were there for that one too? Yeah. Yeah. It was the one in New York. Yeah. Was that 2017? Yeah. Um, I honestly forget, but I remember the event. Um, but I forget what time it was. Yeah. It all just kind of dissipates into the ether, yeah. <laughs> time, you know, but, um, yeah, I didn't meet you there, but I knew that you were on one of the panels, not the one that I was on, but yeah, I mean, since then, you know, I've seen a lot of your work, you know, on your Instagram and, you know, then recently purchasing your book in word and going through your book and, It's really cool to see your growth and also just how humbling your words are and how applicable that it is to life in general. And I guess, you know, like I was wondering, like, what brought you to writing in the first place and how did you discover that process for yourself? Honestly, it's uh, to me, it's so interesting because even to this day, you know, I, I spend so much time writing now, but I don't, I honestly just never saw it coming. Even from, you know, when I was like really young, like 13, or even in my early 20s, or when I was in, in college, I just never, that was never part of my plan was to, to be a writer. And I never actually, I, I never even thought of myself as good as being good at writing. It wasn't something that was like particularly hard, but I never felt like it was one of my strengths. And it really didn't come alive until I started meditating Vipassana. I think after I did my first 10-day course, when it was done, I remember I went back to the place where I was staying. I was staying on this little farm outside of Portland, Oregon, and I wrote this tiny little poem. And I was surprised because like I just I've I've never been like motivated to write poetry or or anything like that. So what I've now looking back in retrospect, what I see 
that was happening was that there was a a good amount of heavy conditioning that was released. And like whenever these like bigger chunks of, you know, denser aspects of ego are let go of, there's more creativity that kind of naturally emerges from the mind. And I think that's what was happening to me. And as I kept doing courses, it was after my like third Vipassana course that I started feeling that like real healing was happening inside of me. There were just big transformations happening in my mind. Like I still have a lot of things to work on, uh, so much more to learn, so much more to let go of. But I felt that there was significant changes that have happened that I wanted to write about. You know, I wanted to explore through writing. I think the idea of even healing yourself, and this was back in 2012, early 2013, it just blew my mind. You know, this was before it became popular on the internet to even start talking about healing, self-healing and letting go and self-love. You know, these weren't really popular topics back then. But it kind of blew my mind that, you know, I was feeling better, that I was actually doing something that was helping me with my anxiety and my stress and my uh, sadness. And that, you know, my, my mind felt a little clearer and felt a little open. So from there, I started this like slow process of writing and just kind of gathering the courage, kind of setting aside time to actually do some writing. And I think around 2015 was when I really started taking it seriously. So then around 2015, is that when you created the avatar or the moniker, I guess, Young Pueblo? I love that you call it an avatar. That's so funny. Um, I know. I, I was like, I was yeah. like, what do I, what do I call it? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I was like, I, maybe that's from just like video game culture, you know, growing up playing copious amounts in, of video games. and Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, likewise. Um, no, yeah. I think it's, it's totally like an internet avatar, but it's really grown. It's um, It's become like a form of just like trying to understand society. And like, I really, you know, after doing enough meditating, I started seeing that like humanity as a whole, like we're super young, like we have so many things that we don't know how to do yet. And Mm. we're still in this process of maturing. I think we, you know, we kind of confuse ourselves sometimes because we have this like great civilization, the world's globalized, you know, we've produced so much in regards to technology, made some advances in health. But in reality, when we're talking about how we are internally and how we treat one another you know we're still just like hurting one another we're not cleaning up after ourselves we we don't you know we don't generally tell the truth like we're not working cooperatively i think we still have a ways to go in terms of growing up um but young pueblo it it was a name that came to me a while i think i probably i probably signed on to instagram as young pueblo in 2013 maybe 2014 Mm-hmm. And then over time, the, the name like started making sense as to like why I picked that name. And I started understanding why, because like, you know, the, the idea of like young and Pueblo, like Pueblo is from my Ecuadorian roots and young is from like, you know, just growing up in America and like understanding that, you know, we're, we have, we have so much more growth to do, but It was, yeah, it was like 2013. And then I was like slowly playing around with it for, I think for like, yeah, for like a year and a half. Um, And it was, at first it was a personal account, but I've since, you know, got rid of all the personal stuff off of it. And, and then when I started taking writing seriously, I realized that this name really sort of fits what I'm trying to do. Because really with all this Young Pueblo stuff, I talk about personal transformation, but it's in the hopes that this will be one of the you know, very many things that different people do to try to help humanity as a whole mature. Yeah. So going back to the meditation retreat that you went to, that first one, and the first time that you started writing or you said you wrote a poem, do you remember what you said or what you wrote down? I think I, um, yeah, I think I do remember. I, I wrote, love is a unity, fuller, when shared and perfect when given and that was it that was this like tiny because i was trying to understand love and i started really understanding that like you know the highest forms of love like my teacher um sn Cuenca, who teaches the vipassana technique um he talks about love being one-way traffic and it's just you know you're just giving and giving and it's interesting because I think a lot of people 
you know, the idea of just giving love sounds risky, but mm. when you start understanding, you know, your own limits, like how much you can give and that it's not just like a constant, like I'm going to give until I'm completely depleted. It's not that at all. It's more mm -hmm. so giving with a balanced mind, like understanding that, you know, you know, this is how much I can give, but in the act, whenever you do give, may it be as selfless as possible. And then when you start surrounding yourself with good people or good partners or good friends, you start realizing that when you are with other people who can meet you where you're at, they're also able to give to you. And then a lot of your needs are also met without having to like demand it or build attachments around it. Yeah. I know this is, or I'm assuming that this is very intentional to title your book inward because I do definitely believe that when you work on yourself as a person, and you know, like these aren't, it's not necessarily a new concept to like, oh, you know, if you work on yourself, then that'll resonate out. But I think that your book in particular is very palpable and palatable approach to, for people to understand these traditionally Taoist philosophies and a modern day approach at looking at that. And I mean, I think it's it's really important, especially in a time where people are incredibly inundated by technology and their phone. I mean, even like if you think about dating apps, for instance, and you're constantly ingraining this idea of expendability through the process of, oh, well, there's going to be another person. So, you know, if this mm -hmm. doesn't work out or this conversation doesn't work out, then, you know, there's always other options, right? Especially in large cities like Los Angeles and New York. but yeah, this idea of, of selfless love and unconditional love as well. Like, did it take you a long time to come to those conclusions or was this, you know, maybe something that you thought of early on, you know, like as you're a kid and you felt that sort of like selfless love, but then something happened along the way and it changed your perspective or is this something that you've grown into as you've gotten older? Uh, that's a great question. I think um, as a kid, honestly, like I was not thinking about selfless love or anything like that. I was, um, you know, just like any other regular kid thinking about like how I'm going to have fun and enjoy my time. And But I, I think that the topics of selfless love and unconditional love, you know, these are really ancient things. And they were topics that I think were the first topics that I started exploring because I remember before I did my first Vipassana course, I read the Bhagavad Gita um, about a mm -hmm. year before then. And that really like just opened my eyes to a lot of different things. And it was really transformative reading that. But um, so I, it was interesting because in the beginning of my like Vipassana journey, I was spending a lot of time thinking about selfless love and unconditional love and what that means. And you know, if these were possibilities, if this was real, but then once I, you know, was able to like, to deepen my understanding of them, I started coming closer because those are, I started realizing those are heights of existence, right? Those are like people who are able to like love selflessly, who are able to love unconditionally and able to do that 24 seven. I think it's totally possible for the average human being, but it takes a lot of cultivation to be able to do that. Um, mm -hmm. like, you know, we're talking like Jesus and the Buddha, you know, that type of, <laughs> that type of level of existence. And I, I think yeah. it's possible, you know, I know some people who've made amazing strides on the path, but when I started backtracking and I was like, okay, I understand these ideas and I understand these goals, but now where am I right now? You know, where are people generally? And it's like, okay, well I need to start cultivating self-love. And it was interesting because at that time in like 2015, 2016, self-love was such a popular topic on Instagram and so many people were trying to understand like, you know, what is this? What does this mean? Like, is this real? Can I apply this in my life? And I started asking myself these same questions and I started seeing that through self-love, if it was real self-love, we're not talking like narcissism and just like giving yourself constant pleasure, but we're talking like this type of self-love where you're trying to get to know yourself, where you're trying to overcome your shadows and re just really like integrate all parts of yourself so that you're not totally compartmentalizing everything or ignoring different parts, but you're just accepting yourself as a whole, the type of self-love that helps you free yourself and heal yourself. And what I started realizing is if you were really engaging with yourself in that type of way, you're actually opening the door to an unconditional love for yourself and other beings. 
and, you know, sort of building a bridge between these two. And I think that's what inward is like, you know, inward is daringly minimalistic. It's, you know, I really Hmm. wanted to kind of push the boundaries of minimalism because I think, you know, a lot of books are fantastic when they go into these different topics, but I also think that it's, it's pretty helpful to have something short to be able to consider and, and then just allow your own perspective to expand around it as opposed to being told yeah. this, this is exactly what you should think and this is exactly what it is. You know, I really just, I don't think of myself as a teacher. Like I think of myself as an explorer and along this like journey of exploration, it's helpful for me to just like kind of narrow down these topics so that it's like, okay, this is, you know, this is what unconditional love is, or this is what self-love is, or, you know, different things to understand in the mind and how we interact with other people. But being able to summarize that in these sort of like tight, like, um, you know, tightly knit formats, I think is helpful for me. And, and it's so far has been helpful for other people too. Yeah. It's also interesting, like when you do work on yourself and that energy resonates throughout you, and how much more space that you have to actually give back to other people. Even one of the chapters of your book, and you know what I really like about it is that you can open up your book at basically any page and have some sort of tidbit of wisdom to be able to chew upon throughout the day. And it's kind of one of those books where you can just carry around with you and constantly revisit it. And at different points in your life, you can come to new conclusions and new understandings. It's kind of like, uh, that's in general, that's what I like about good art is that it will give back to you in ways that you don't even foresee in later parts of your life, depending on what you're going through at that particular time. Oh, wow. Thank you. I, you know, I designed the book that way because what I kept thinking about when I was putting the book together was people who were in New York City on the way to work and they have a few stops on the on the tr- on the subway and they can just open the book up you know like pull it out of their bag or their purse and just look at it read a few a few pages and then have something to to think about or you know explore within themselves as they move about throughout the day and you know I kept thinking like we not only do we live in a time where you know, the demands on our attention are so extremely high. You know, everything is trying to get our attention. Like now, now it's not only ads and different forms of like corporate media, but like us as individuals, you know, like so many people have created their own businesses. Everyone's on social media and everyone's looking to get other people's attention. I thought that if I were going, if I was going to be successful at connecting with people, I need to be able to just like, you know, summarize it and literally just make it black and white so that it um, stands out, captures someone's eye, and hopefully if they connect with it, then, um, you know, they may want to come back in the future and read some more. Yeah, and it's also interesting how when you connect more and and deeper within yourself, you can, it allows you to be able to connect further with other people in a more genuine and compassionate and empathetic way. And um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, what I was going to ask, earlier, um, like in regards to self-love, one of the chapters in your book is entitled self-love. And I was wondering how you divided these chapters in your book, distance, union, interlude, self-love and understanding. Like what was the intention behind titling each chapter that? I, I love, I've never gotten that question, but it's so, that was one of the funnest parts of putting the book together was, you know, realizing within myself, what my process has been so far. And probably the most critical chapter is the first one is like distance. We don't realize like what you were just saying earlier, how far away we are from ourselves. And the the more that we meet ourselves, the more that honesty sort of brings us closer to ourselves, the better that we can engage with other human beings, the more, the better we can love them, the better we can support them, the better we can know and understand them. But that feeling of distance, you know, when I was connecting with how I had been before I started meditating, before I really started engaging in my own like introspective journey, I was so far away from my loved ones, from my friends, from my girlfriend. And there were these barriers, you know, because simply because I had not explored areas of myself 
I was only able to connect with people on superficial slash like intermediate levels, but not really like at the greatest depth that I possibly could just because I hadn't, you know, I hadn't done that work within myself. And when I started seeing that as I was unlocking these different aspects of myself, I was able to like, you know, love my girlfriend so much better, my now wife, or like love my mom and my mom and my dad so much better and understand them so much better. And there's also this one poem and in word that comes later on, but it's like, you know, the better that I understand myself, the better that I can literally understand the world. Because if I'm a mystery to myself, then the world is just going to seem so overwhelming, so confusing. And mm. I understood that distance was one of the major things we were going to try to overcome. You know, you want to be closer to yourself. And part of the loneliness that we feel is actually being driven by how far away we are from ourselves. Um, if there isn't honesty there, especially like a radical type of of honesty, um, then it's going to be it's going to be quite a struggle to feel like you're you know held properly, mm -hmm. even when even when you're around other people. Do you think that you consciously or unconsciously created that distance between you and other people? Ah, uh, that's a good question. I think it was. I think for the most part, it was unconscious. Um, like I wasn't really aware, like, you know, I think a lot of times when people think about introspective work, they, you know, even if they don't have any major problems or they don't have any major traumas, then they ask themselves, you know, do I even need to meditate? Do I even need to, you know, have a therapist or do I even need to do any of this type of stuff? But you don't quite realize that you can be less anxious. You can be less stressful. You can, you know, feel happier. And I think it was the same for me as an individual in regards to the distance, like I didn't realize that you could be closer to people that you could have, you know, a deeper bond. Um, mm. but I think a lot of it was driven unconsciously just because when you're so focused on trying to fulfill your attachments, trying to like make these images in your mind come true, trying to pursue pleasure and, you know, confusing, confusing pleasure for happiness, then it's going to be really easy to, to just, you know, be blind to the fact that a lot of, you know, what you're looking for is actually inside of yourself. And if, you know, if that distance is really great, then it's just going to keep driving you to seek for these things outside of you. Yeah. And I was listening to a podcast interview with you and my friend, Corey Allen. I was listening to it earlier this morning, actually. And you were talking about being addicted to pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It, it was a hard, and I think there's, there's, there's levels to it, man. I think it's interesting you know, I had an idea of it, of how much I was addicted to pleasure as I had been meditating. But then over the past few years, I started doing longer meditation courses. And I remember after I did my first 30 day course, it was shocking, you know, to see how much I was really addicted to pleasure. Like I was literally just molding my life around what I wanted. And you know, there's, it's, that's, and that's one thing that I want to make clear. Like, it's fine to have goals. It's fine to have desires, but to be blind to like how much we're constantly pursuing pleasure and the moments where we're feeling anxiety or feeling some sort of mental tension, it's because we're not at the moment constantly, you know, filling our like sensorial apparatus with pleasure. And it's just, um, it's really interesting to see how much of a dominating impact it has on our lives and our actions. And when I started, you know, becoming more and more aware of that, I was able to start noticing that constantly trying to fulfill my pleasure was just not giving me satisfaction. You know, I was still, still have, you know, a mind full of tension, still struggling, but mm. that instead of pleasure, you know, it's a much more productive goal to, cultivate inner peace not like pursue inner peace because that doesn't quite make sense but you want to like cultivate you want to build it inside of yourself definitely yeah it's really interesting that you said you said that yeah because i think like whenever i personally feel a fit of anxiety or something like that i think it's because i'm not i haven't felt that inner peace or what i like to think about is fluidity and and flow and you know you can equate that to so i do a lot of martial arts and i've been doing that for since I was 20 years old. So I equate, you know, the artistic practice and martial arts and the physicality of those activities to this idea of, of flow and allowing yourself to be in that 
flow state. And I think part of that, a large part of it is, is finding that inner peace for yourself and being able to channel it and understand what is your personal idea of, of inner peace. What's my, oh man. Um, honestly, my, my idea of inner peace is being able to be so with what is real inside of this whole mind body system. And so like deeply accepting of what's happening in the moment that you're able to appreciate the impermanence of all things. And you're just basically feeling all of the arising and passing that's happening at the sort of like, you know, wider levels and the more um, like minute, like microscopic levels, like on the actual body. And yeah. I think that the moments where I'm, I'm able to like profoundly embrace impermanence, like as it is, just like feeling all the changes that are rapidly happening in the body, then those are the times when my mind is like the least tense, the most calm, the most like, you know, just accepting of what's happening. And, I, and honestly, those are the times when I learn the most where it's not like I'm, I'm there to directly learn like the way when you pick up a book and start reading it, not like intellectual information, but we're talking like insight, you know, when you're, when the mind just becomes so open and receptive that these like light bulbs just start opening up and you're, you you just um, are allowing that much more mental clarity to just like come in really sharply into the mind. And it's funny how when you connect with reality, because we don't realize like, you know, at the atomic level, at the physical level, at the mental level, like everything's changing super, super rapidly. And everything that we see as still and static, you know, it's only because our minds can't perceive um, how rapid everything is really changing. But when you close your eyes and you expand your awareness and you're able to feel the, um, the rea- like the quantum reality, you know, like of like how everything is rapidly, rapidly changing, in those moments, you know, you're in touch with like the fabric of the universe and you are able to just, you know, feel the truth of things. And when you're connecting with the truth of things, you're actually really far away from delusion. And in that sort of space, you, um, the mind just starts, you know, lighting up with insight. But yeah, during those moments, I feel a lot of inner peace. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I mean, that's, 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 that's great. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, when I, was reading your book too and thinking about that idea of distance i was thinking about this idea of having distance from certain problems or certain things that we perceive as being problems and being able to dissect that and open that up and understand and look at it at a different perspective and sometimes i think it's just about looking at things at a slightly skewed perspective to see that, oh, this is actually not a problem at all. It's just, (laughs) I was looking at it as if this was, you know, uh, an issue. It's kind of like that old saying, um, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, I I love that you're pointing that out because I, I have this experience, you know, I've had it multiple times now where right before I go away to another meditation course, I'm like going into it and I'm thinking about all these problems I have. And then I come out and I'm like, dang, I have no problems. You know, like, I, like <laughs> yeah. what, what I thought was a problem was literally just me like rapidly, like, you know, creating tension around this idea. And in reality, mm. like, you know, if with, with most things, like, I think there is definitely like worst case scenario things where something bad really does happen. But a lot of times, you know, like, 95% of these bad thoughts that you're having, they don't, they don't really come true. And even if they do, it's actually not that bad. You know, you're going to be fine. And life is all about change. Like if you're not able to embrace the reality that things change, people come and go, you know, jobs change, you know, like the fa- family structures change. If, if you're not able to accept those changes, then yeah, life will definitely be a struggle. But if you can, then, you know, not only can you like interact with what's happening with more love and you're able to be much more present, that much more, you know, supportive of your, your, you know, community members or family members during hard times, but you're also able to just like think a lot more clearly because the reality is that everything's changing. We're we're literally like life is much more like a flowing river than, than the static reality that we see. Yeah. It's, and it's also interesting to think about just, observing people that are close and dear to us in life and you know everyone's fallible we're human and 
just mm-hmm. understanding how people intake certain problems and if they're able to adapt to those changes or to not. For example, the martial arts training and stuff, I see a lot of black belts in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Specifically, I use that as like a um, as an example because generally when you have your black belt, you've been doing the sport for a very long period of time. It generally takes about 10 years to get your black belt for an mm-hmm. average person in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And a lot of people I see are still training with like insane neck, shoulder injuries, knee injuries. And I kind of take that as a failure to accept and be able to adapt that the idea of your body will eventually fail on you and to keep trying to push through mentally, it's almost doing a disservice to yourself. And it also is a reflection of ego. And, but I'm, I, you know, I'm, I, I don't really use that as like a, uh, an example to like judge other people. It's just for me to observe and understand my personal, what my personal goals are, I guess, and what yeah. is important to me, you know, and it's just kind of a microcosm of, I think, human existence in general, not like the failure to accept the truth. Yes, exactly. I, you know, I have a story to a friend that I just had lunch with um, a few days ago. He's a nurse and he was telling us a story about how he had a patient who was really old. She was, she was about 95 years old and she was, you know, um, passing away. But he said, you know, it was so strange the conversation he had to have with the family because the the family is still, you know, trying their best to to keep their, you know, their grandmother or great grandmother alive. And honestly, like, you know, lovingly so, like there's nothing wrong with that. But like the idea of not being able to embrace the reality that like, you know, she's ninety five. Like she's she's, you know, lived a long life. Like to to be so fortunate to have lived that long is already a massive victory. But he said that, you know, it's it, to him, it's like so strange. Like, obviously, he wants to try his best to keep the person, whomever it is, alive. But he's like, when you're, he's like, when you're like, you know, trying to do like CPR on a 95 year old person and trying to explain to the family, like, you know, that's it. There's not much we can do. Like, they're, they're just, you know, it's, it's their time. It sounds like such a, such a challenge, you know, for, for the mind because we're so geared towards trying to, you know, push away change and just like keep everything around us the same that, you know, we can't like embrace the fact that like, you know, this, this person has had their time and they, they've lived a beautiful life and, you know, we should, it's fine to like miss someone and to, you know, even want for them to be there. But mm-hmm. the reality is that like, you know, in a hundred years, like we'll all be gone. <laughs> and, and yeah. like, you know, and like, I think when you're able to embrace that reality that like, yes, like things will continue changing, I think it can make you so much more present to what's happening now. Because, and I think that's been one of the the biggest shifts between um, my wife and I's relationship, like knowing that, you know, we're, we're so committed to each other, but eventually like, you know, one of us will pass away. So, and that that idea to me, even if it's like when we're 80 or 90 or a hundred, you know, who knows what, what'll happen. But that has made me try to be so much more present, so much more loving with her to like, you know, not let like the little things get in the way or, you know, little squabbles and just realizing that like, oh, like what I have now is actually an opportunity and I'm going to try to make the most of it. And when it's over, you know, who knows like what, what may happen or with any other type of relationship, like, let me just enjoy it now, make the most of it and try my best. And, um, when things change, they'll change. Yeah, it's, that's a beautiful way of looking at unconditional love and also being able to appreciate those moments that you have with your loved ones, whether it's your wife or your parents or, you know, because I think a lot of the times, and maybe it's ingrained with our society too, is to constantly push for something better and greater and, you know, and maybe that's just like kind of a symptom of Western culture and Western ideology, but and also probably a reason why we look to the East for certain philosophies. Right. But it's really good to constantly remind yourself of that constantly being present, understanding that this moment is the only moment that we have right now and to be there now. Yeah, no. And I was thinking too, like I wanted to make sure like that, you know, people understand. I think what I'm trying to say is, is like, I'm not, 
like letting go is not cold heartedness, right? It's, it is literally just fully accepting the now and the reality that, you know, things are just, they're just always changing. And when you can accept that things are always changing, things are, you know, it's much easier to let go of what's happened in the past or what you're afraid of that may happen in the future. And you're able to just to more deeply engage with the reality that's right in front of you. And, um, you know, cause, cause I think actually when you're able to let go of these like attachments of the future and the past that you're able to, um, I don't know, just lo- love everybody around you that much better. I, can, I completely agree. So going back to the, um, titles of these chapters. So union interlude, self-love and understanding what sparked those titles to come into existence. Union kind of made sense because that's kind of what I felt like was happening within me was after I started getting to know myself, after I started like having the courage to, you know, just like explore my own inner forest was I felt this like sense of unity. Like before, like a clear example is like in the past, I would spend so much time avoiding myself. Like it was, it was like a mission. Like I would try my best to always just not be alone, not spend time with myself, always watching TV, always being on the internet or trying to like hang out with my friends all the time so that they can help me not um, spend time with myself. Like I could, I could just constantly be extroverting and when I started actually doing, you know, real inner work and, and started closing that distance from myself, I started feeling that um, I was becoming more and more okay with being alone. And that was such a struggle before. And I remember, I think it was a quote by Bell Hooks, and she said that something along the lines of like, if you can be by yourself, then you're going to be much more able to not, you know, oppress or use other people when you're spending time with them. And I started seeing the reality of that, you know, that I just like the more I was able to be alone, the more present I was able to be with other people. And to me, that felt like a union happening, like I was becoming closer to myself. And, um, and that Mm -hmm. felt like a really big victory. And then after I was able to be closer to myself, you know, a lot more understanding started happening. So that's where that, that, that last chapter gets its title from and then like interlude i just wanted to explore the story that i had been building in my mind um of this like older wise person and um younger people asking them questions and self-love is you know just exploring self-love because especially when i was releasing the book then it was such a big topic that i thought you know let me give it its time what about uh, understanding oh under- understanding um like it comes after union you know like after doing that inner work after com- really bringing yourself together, um, understanding is sort of what you get because once you have that unity, um, all that like light of insight can come in and you'll start, you know, better understanding, not just yourself, but like the fabric of reality and how things work in interpersonal situations. Yeah. It's interesting too. And then the more, the deeper of an understanding that you have for yourself, the more that you understand these subtle nuances and it's almost becomes cyclical again, like, you know, because there's going to be areas and times when you have resistance. I mean, it might be just a different resistance, but then you'll have to remind yourself like, oh no, I've been through this before and, um, and it's okay. And being able to sit in those feelings and try to dissect and understand it for yourself, it's just, it's healthy. Yeah, completely. I think it's, it's, it's so interesting how much we can actually build compassion through this process because when you start like really paying attention to your own patterns and start noticing like how you know all of this like emotional history that you've accumulated over time is like affecting your daily behavior and you start seeing okay like in these type of situations I normally react like this I normally react like that and when you start building space in your mind so that you can you know basically start living in a new way, you know, start making decisions that aren't based on the past that aren't based on like these immediate impulses. And you can feel the impulse without it, you know, getting control of you, you start um, Mm. developing this understanding of yourself. And that just opens the door to compassion for other people. Because yes, you have a very different history than I do. But our mental structures are essentially the same. 
So the way that you have anxiety, the way that you struggle, you know, it's really similar to the way that I struggle. So when you build this understanding in yourself, you're able to have like a brand new compassion for other people because you're you you start becoming aware of the mechanics that are happening inside of them. And especially if they're having a hard time and whatnot, you know, you can see that in yourself because you you just, you know, have all that knowledge now of of how hard it is and how and also how to overcome it. Yeah, and it's good to not be reactionary towards other people's potential toxicity. And a lot of the times when people are angry, they're more so just trying to be understood and yeah. yeah, And trying to, you know, and if it's directly towards us, you know, trying to have someone else relate to them and to be able to understand that cognitively and just to have some sort of objectivity from that. I think, and then, you know, and being compassionate towards that person, I think you know, it's very healthy. Yeah. And I think it's interesting, especially when you're, when you're having a tough time with another individual, um, something that's become, that's been becoming more clear to me lately is how like a lot of the tough emotions that we feel, they'll be sort of lingering under the surface and these tough emotions will be looking for an object to attach themselves to. And sometimes, you know, that'll look like, oh, you know, like, you know, you, you basically find a reason to get mad at someone who's in proximity to you. That's why mm. a lot of people struggle with, you know, having relation, having um, difficulties in their relationships or difficulties with close friends because the people closest to us are the ones who like catch, you know, who end up like catching our fire basically um, mm-hmm. because when we get upset and uh, obviously there are totally the moments where someone just does something wrong to you and, you know, that, that emotion is sort of activated by that sensation that the person caused. But then the, there are also the other moments where, you know, you're just not feeling that well, or, you know, this morning, like I, I literally woke up this morning and, um, I like say good morning to my wife. And I was like laughing. Cause I was like, wow, I had, I, I just like had such angry dreams, you know, like I had no idea. I, I don't remember anything of what was happening, but it was just like full of anger. And I'm sure that if I had allowed my mind to just continue on that train, it would have looked for an object outside in my like, you know, awakened life to connect to, to continue that like charged up anger. But oftentimes, um, and that's something that my wife and I have been practicing is like, as she comes home from work and she feels like, you know, she's had a tough day. She'll just let me know, like, you know, I'm not feeling that good. So in that way, you know, she, brings it up to the surface like we're both aware that she doesn't feel good i do my best to hold space for her and she also does her best to not like unnecessarily get mad at something very little that isn't you know that it's actually not about that at all it's actually just that her like strong and turbulent emotions were just looking for stories to kind of keep building that fire yeah and i mean i think that's where you know maturity and emotional intelligence come into play to be able to dissect those feelings I don't know. I'm just going to have a personal anecdote here. But when I was, you know, growing up and, and first doing martial arts, uh, I would utilize martial arts and workouts and things like that to channel my anger from the past or from people of the present at that time. And, you know, to not deal with certain emotions, I think, like from a cognitive level and open it up, like, you need multiple channels for those things. You know, it can't just be just the physical Uh because then you're not actually dealing with the actual problem. You're just masking it essentially. And the older that I get and the more that I talk to people like yourself, (laughs) um, I, I just realized that how many different channels there are to be able to dissect your emotions. And, um, journaling is a, is another one that I personally like to use. And Uh uh yeah, I'm also, I'm curious, like what is your day-to-day writing process? Cause I'm assuming that you focus a majority of your time just sitting down and writing now. Is that right? Um, I'm trying to honestly, man, it's, um, my day-to-day in the morning, especially, I do a lot of writing. And I also pick up and write whenever I get, you know, moments of inspiration. And, you know, a sentence will come in my mind and I'll, I'll feel the clarity of a message. But 
um, a lot of my time is honestly like administrative things, like just answering emails, like organizing events, like, you know, talking about book contracts and stuff like that. So a lot of that stuff, I need to like better sort of like structure the way, you know, the way that I'm doing things so that, um, so that I don't have to do as much of that administrative work. Cause honestly, it's, it's been a big shift. Like as things have been growing, um, I've had less time to, to just focus on writing, especially cause like the, when I, when I wrote inward the first time, um, when I, yeah, when I wrote inward, I, you know, I had my, my inbox was empty. Like no one was trying to email me, you know, I was mm-hmm. literally just like, you know, had my time to myself and was really focused on meditating and writing. And, and now it's the same, you know, like my primary, my, my number one goal is always meditation. Like that's, that's the, the, the vehicle that I'm using to cultivate my freedom. And then, mm-hmm. you know, writing is sort of like a byproduct of that. And I spend my time writing as much as I can, but I also don't want to overdo it because if I feel like if I feel like the the inspiration isn't there or for some reason, you know, there's a week where like a lot of stuff is just not, you know, things aren't like coming up, then, then obviously it's like a learning week or it's a time to like rest or it's a time to, to not, um, you know, I don't want to force creativity. And that's something yeah. that, that has been um, like a really big lesson is like just not forcing it so that when it does come, cause I've, I've noticed that honestly the best, like the best pieces that I've written, the best, like, things that I feel really good about, they'll kind of sometimes land like, like lightning, you know, they just kind of, they come in really quickly and then I'll clean them up a little bit and then Mm. release them and people will really connect to them. But if I'm trying to force it, then it's not that good. hmm. What what do you do as that practice? I mean, do you have like, do you use a notepad, like a physical notepad, or do you use, you know, you do you have your laptop next to you or, or do you just write something into your phone? Like do you, while you're sleeping, then you suddenly wake up and then you just write, jot something down and then clean it up in the morning or like, what is the process like? Yeah. Most, so most of it is, um, is in the morning. Like I'll, I'll do a lot of writing either on my laptop or my phone. Um, my phone will have a lot of like shorter things. Like if, if I'm ever going to write like an essay, most of the time that's, that's on my, on my computer. But a lot of that is done in the morning when I wake up and I feel fresh and, and I'll do like some writing. And then after, after that I'll meditate because I, I normally meditate in the morning and in the evening. Um, mm. I've been doing that every day for like four or five years now. And I, yeah, so I do writing then, but then I also take other times where like if I'm in like in a cab ride or something like that, or, or I'm like in the train, like in the subway, like on the, on route to somewhere, I'll like kind of just ask myself, you know, what's been on my mind lately. So I'll like jot things down, but honestly, like a lot of things are on my phone and, um, which is like kind of fun because I'm, you know, that's, it's, it's the technology I have. I don't have like a pen and paper with me all the time. Yeah. Do you feel like, I mean, I've kind of been postulating this theory for myself, but I haven't been able to sit down and talk to a neuroscientist about this in particular, but do you feel like you're more in tune with your subconscious mind when you write something in the morning? Oh, that's a good question. I haven't thought of that. Um, all I do know is that, and I'm not a neuroscientist. I just, I'm a meditator. Like, I don't, yeah. Tell, tell me uh, how you activate your cerebral cortex. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I do know is that um, the subconscious mind, right? Like, there are so many things happening, so many processes, but a lot of what um, and I think this is what Carl Jung said too, but basically more and more of what was once subconscious becomes clear to you. Like it just um, becomes part of your consciousness. And I think like as you keep meditating, as you keep digging deeper, like what was once your consciousness and it was only like, you know, 3% of your mind starts growing and becomes like 7% of your mind, 8% of your mind and more and more of your mind becomes, <clears throat> you know, is not, is not hidden from you anymore. But I don't know, but I think the morning, the morning does feel very good. I think in particular, the morning is like when, um, like the, the creativity is the sharpest. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I think it's fun. The other thing that I try to like 
stay open about in terms of creativity is just being flexible. Like, you know, I've definitely also written some things like right before I go to bed or like if I'm in bed and having, you know, it takes a while to go to sleep, I'll um, see if there's anything on my mind or if I'm just like, you know, having like a really good conversation with someone and then this idea comes up. So I always like, I try to stay ready like as if i'm playing baseball like i have my my mitt open and i'm just like trying to you know catch whatever comes Hmm. yeah yeah i think stephen pressfield calls that the muse being able to listen to the muse you know that book uh the war of art Yeah, yeah 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 it's really interesting to be able to dissect different people's creative processes and yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's why I made a podcast about it, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm finally coming to that conclusion right now. <laughs> I've reached an epiphany and you've been able to witness it. Um, awesome. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, you know, I, I really appreciate you for coming on to this podcast and yeah, it's been really amazing to see your growth internally as a human being and, you know, just you being able to help so many people, you know, help them go through certain things. And it's interesting because it sounds like a lot of these things that you've been writing about, you know, you feel or you're working through yourself internally, but how much that resounds throughout just you utilizing social media, you know, as a device to be able to reach out to other people and your book and, and everything like that. And yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's great. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you for such a nice conversation. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I'm I'm literally just trying my best and I'm like learning alongside everybody else. And it's it's really nice that some of the things I write people find useful because I think at the end of the day, Young Pueblo is like the point of it is to to serve. So I'm, yeah. glad, it's, I'm glad it's doing that. Young Pueblo, you're an avatar. Yeah, the <laughs> avatar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, hopefully... Um... We can meet up sometime when either I'm in New York or you're in LA. Yeah, for sure. That'd be awesome. Um, thank you so much, man. This has been great. Definitely. Thanks, man. Music for the podcast is by Rarebit, a.k.a. Justin Dosher Hopkins. Creative producer is Kelly Kekich and editing help by Matthew A. Paul.